<clears throat> chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. We've been looking at the subject, the fight of faith, and uh, I'm going to continue that the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> have a little break next week as we have a missionary, but uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> You'll have to listen real carefully tonight, all right? <laughs> Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love in whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So he says the end of our faith is saved. Heaven, looking forward to that. Um, but he talks there in verse 7 about the trial of your faith. And in verse 6, uh, for a season, if need be. Now, not everybody has the same experience, but... Uh, there's, there's manifold temptations. Do you know the word manifold? It means lots and lots of variety. <laughs> um, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, now that's, that's what we're talking about here, the fight of faith. Uh, it might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This fight starts when we're saved when we're established in the faith. That's uh, what we've been talking about from Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, he, he said that we're supposed to walk the, the same way we were saved. Uh, As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted, built up in him, and established in the faith. <clears throat> so we receive Christ as Savior. He establishes us. It's by faith. We trust him. He, he roots us. He plants us. And uh, we walk in Him. We walk in Him by faith. We walk in Him by God's power. That's really important for us to see that. Uh, our walk is the same as how we got saved. It's by faith. It's by God's power. Uh, you're not saved by works. You're not saved by your power. You're saved by faith. You're saved by God's power. Well, the same way we, we live. I, I find, I don't know, maybe I'm just a simple person, but... I find simple things like that really helpful. And the enemy's goal, we saw there in verse 8, is to spoil us. Beware lest any man spoil you. Have you ever had something that would have been perfectly good, but it got spoiled? Yeah, there's Christians like that. They, they could serve the Lord, but they, they got spoiled. They got messed up, you know. Now, God has a way of, of refreshing us, and, and there's always something we can, we can do. But uh, that's, that's Satan's goal is to spoil us. And we looked at some of the things here in Colossians. Uh, he can do it through philosophy. There's some people who just love to use their minds. <clears throat> well, mind is a good thing. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. But uh, sometimes you can get so involved in the thinking that you, you're so caught up in that that you leave behind the grace of God and, and all those things. Um, we looked at legalism. If some people like to be really hard. Boom, you know, they black and everything's black and white and uh, that Satan can use that to spoil us uh, mysticism some people are real airy fairy you know and we all have tendencies don't we we can use it for good or we can allow it to be used for bad uh, asceticism we use that term self-denial you know there's some people who think that being really spiritual means you you can't have any you know any benefits you know you can't have any blessings everything's got to be hard but God doesn't say that uh, one of the battles of faith, you know, those were four that we looked at. Another battle that we, we face is to maintain doctrinal purity. If you look at Colossians 2, verses 4 and 5. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Um, in Jude, he talks about the, the that's the word he uses, um, contend for the faith, once established. 
given, you know, God has given us the faith. And uh, there's a battle to just stay true to God's word. There, there's temptations to, to leave that. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This could be almost an unending series. <laughs> the battle of faith, the fight of faith. But 1 Timothy chapter 6, and um, <clears throat> I'm going to read the first five verses of the chapter. And this has to do with doctrinal purity, and then we're going to move on to a couple more. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Isn't that an interesting verse? Talking about personal relationships, talking about your relationship to your boss, and it's important you, you do the right thing so that God's doctrine is not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So he's saying it's a battle to, uh, to maintain doctrinal purity because it'll affect everything you do. And it comes out, what you really believe comes out in how you live. You can say whatever you want, but what you really believe is how you live. And uh, th that's part of the battle of, of faith, the fight of faith. There, there's a lot of other things. Did you notice in verse 4, he is proud. You know, we battle against pride. Uh, verse 5, uh, corrupt minds, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, you know, corruption. Uh, we battle that. I wanted to, I'm just going to, this week and the next time, look at, at two of these battles. One is the battle with lust, and the other is the battle with afflictions. Lust basically is from within. Uh, there's, there's things that somebody else might really lust after that you could care less about. You know, it's not the thing, it, it's what you think about it, or the situation. Lust and then afflictions, the, the, the things that are flung at you, the, the, the life that uh, uh, you're being afflicted with or blessed with. Uh, we're going to look and uh, continue on there in verse 6, the fight of faith against lust. <coughs> verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, <clears throat> and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So we'll look at this, uh, this subject that he talks about there. Um, the, the fight of faith against, really, he's talking there about lust. He particularly relates it to money. Um, and one of the things he says to do, there's, you know, the Lord has it, uh, he has a three-point outline here, and it's alliterated. <laughs> he says, flee, follow, and fight, <laughs> all right? And there's a sermon right there. Uh, sometimes the best thing you can do with a temptation is run away. Uh, you know, the classic example is Joseph. That lady grabbed him, and he left his coat in her hand and ran. <laughs> that didn't stop him getting punished but he didn't get punished for doing wrong. They punished him for, they lied about it, you know. Much better that than, than, uh, than the other way. 
Uh, God says sometimes we have to flee, flee these things. Now, uh, there, there's a lot of things that come up in the Bible where this, this will uh, uh, be mentioned. I, I notice four. I'll just give them to you. I'm not going to read the verses, but uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, he says, flee fornication. And that's, that's a way of life in our, our day and age. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 14, flee idolatry. You're not to worship anything but the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lusts. I'm, I'm, these are all quotes from Scripture here. Flee youthful lusts. And then here in our passage, he says, flee these things. Now, when you're reading your Bible and you see something like that, you should stop and think, what are these things? <laughs> and uh, at least it's what's in the chapter before, maybe even more. And you might have noticed as, we, as we've read the, the chapter 6 there, <clears throat> we talked about... Um, our relationship to our boss, honoring others, really, I, I think it comes back to being disrespectful to others. Have you ever had somebody treat you with disrespect? You know, we say, treat us like dirt or something. God says, as Christians, we're not to do that. It doesn't matter what they're doing and who they are. Uh, we're, to, we're to treat them with respect. And it's particularly, he talks about masters. Uh, he says, you know, you might be tempted to treat someone with disrespect. He says, flee those things. Don't, don't do it. Uh, making trouble. He talked in verse 3, if any man teach otherwise, uh, verse 4, he's proud. He has a corrupt mind. You know, there's people who are, are trying to make trouble. God says, flee that. Don't, don't, don't let that get a foot in the door of your life. You, know, you think of something, you think, oh, that'll, that'll put a spoke in their wheel or you know, whatever you say it. Uh, you know, flee that. Run away from that. Don't do it. Uh, and then, of course, we know it particularly applies to the love of money. That's the last thing that, that he's mentioned there uh, in verse 10. The love of money. Uh, you know, run, run away from that. Don't, don't make that the goal of your life. Uh, and then in verse 3, he says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Uh, that's a real general way of saying, you know, God's word. If someone is disrespectful and, and dishonest with God's word, we need to run away from that. Look at Romans, well, you can just listen to it. Romans 13, verse 14. <clears throat> he says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. He says, Put on the Lord Jesus. It makes me think of uh, Ephesians 6, where he talks about the armor of God. You know, remember what you have in Christ. Put on the Lord, and he says, don't make provision for the flesh. Now, I, I think, now maybe I'm wrong, but I think there's sometimes when that's all we're doing <laughs> is making provision for the flesh. You know, we're, we're so concerned about our feelings or what's going to happen, you know, the physical side of things that we forget life. The part we're concerned about is the eternal part. Uh, we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and not make provision for the flesh. Now, that's not saying don't brush your teeth, don't go to work, you know. It's just saying don't live for, for the flesh. <coughs> the, uh, the other word that he had there was flee, was flee, and then he says follow. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. It's, it's not enough to run away from the bad things. We also have to take on board the, the things of the Lord. Uh, if you look in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 14, First Peter chapter 1, he uses a word here that I found um, generally you want to avoid in normal conversation. I've learned that the hard way. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversations, because, as it, is, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. A couple of things there. God tells us, don't be ignorant. You know, follow God's word. Now, that's the word I was saying. That's a perfectly good word. But if you tell somebody they're ignorant, <laughs> they take it as an insult. We're ignorant about a lot of things, you know. 
It doesn't mean that that's a bad thing all the time. But when it comes to the things of the Lord, we need to quit being ignorant. You know, it's not enough to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. and Oh, it's just all faith. It's got to be faith because I don't know anything. <laughs> uh, he says later on in Peter, he says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. I think it's important to see he's, the first thing he says is add character, add godliness, and then, and then knowledge. And knowledge is not the only thing, but it is important. Uh, do, don't be ignorant, do be holy. Let me give you a couple of verses that uh, talk about ignorance. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. God says, don't be ignorant about death that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. As Christians, we shouldn't live with the despair the world throws at us. All right? Romans 11.25, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, that ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. If you don't know what that's talking about, you're ignorant. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> Now you need to find out about the difference between Jew and Gentile in the church. There's a difference, and God has been working right through history. A mystery, when he talks about in the Bible, is something that we didn't used to know that God has shown us. He said this, this was a mystery, but uh, we can understand it now. 1 Corinthians 10.1, Brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea shouldn't be ignorant about history, Bible history, about what happened to Israel and, and those things. 1 Corinthians 12, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. We shouldn't be ignorant about spiritual gifts. God's given every Christian a spiritual gift. We should know that. You should have at least an idea of what your gift possibly could be um, and try to use it. You know? uh, God says, don't be ignorant, do be holy. Uh, in, in 1 Peter 1, verse 15, uh, you know, where he said, the one who called you is holy, you should be holy. In all manner of conversation, every, every part of your life. Uh, like I said, it's very similar to 2 Peter 1, 5, where he says, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge. Add holiness and knowledge to your faith. That's part of the fight. Yeah, there's things we flee, there's things we follow. Add to your faith. And the third word was fight. <clears throat> uh, be in the battle. Don't expect <clears throat> to be on the Lord's side and not have a fight. You know, when, when you trusted Christ as Savior, you stepped across a line that made enemies. Uh, he says in, in Timothy, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's going to be something happen at some time in your life because you're a Christian and you stand for the Lord. Uh, we're not spectators is what he's saying. Uh, sometimes you have to fight. Sometimes you have to flee. God help us to know the difference. You know, there's, there's a time for different time for different things. One of the biggest fights I, I find is fighting selfishness. You know, it's, we just tend to be that way, don't we? Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 You probably, this is one of those verses when you read it, you think, oh, I know that verse. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. They that are Christ's, that means they belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. We've given ourselves to the Lord. We, Romans talks about how we died with Christ. We're dead to those things. And uh, we need to quit being selfish and uh, die to self. And the Bible tells us that faith is worth fighting for. You know, there's some things in life that aren't worth fighting for. Uh, we're experiencing that every once in a while with the kids. You know, man, they can fight over something at the drop of a hat, you know. And then pretty soon they've forgotten about it or thrown it away. Uh, but faith is worth fighting for. Uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 7, when we read, The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. You know, if, if you were to win a million dollars, a billion dollars, you think, wow, that's great. You can't take it to heaven with you. 
Yeah, that's what he said in Timothy, for sure. You can't take it to heaven with you. But your faith, you can't. Your faith will take you to heaven. And uh, what a blessing. It's, it's, uh, it's precious. In uh, 1 Timothy, where we re read, he said, lay hold on eternal life. Take possession of it. <laughs> Grab hold of, of this faith that God has, has given to you. Understand what you have in Christ. You know, the Bible says we, in Romans 6 that we're dead to sin. Grab hold of that. You know, don't, uh, don't be ignorant. Uh, get, get involved in the battle, but get involved in, in, in a knowledgeable way. You, you don't want to just, uh, how did Paul put it? You know, I, I fight not as one that beateth the air. You know, we're not shadow boxing. We're not just flinging our arms around. Uh, we want to we want to fight in a in a godly, uh, Bible believing way. Understand what you have in Christ. In Galatians, he says, "This I say then: Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh." You know, often we live by feelings, by our lusts, rather than by faith. God wants us to live by faith, and uh, you know, Paul wrote. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy chapter 4, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Yeah, he, uh, he saw that there was, uh, there was a battle. It was worth fighting. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That there's a reward. And not only is it precious just in itself, but there's also a reward. Uh, lust is a terrible enemy to faith. And you can see as we've gone on about this, you could talk a lot about this because lust, it, uh, it occupies a lot of ground. Uh, there's a lot of avenues that it, it approaches us. And uh, yet God has given us the victory in Christ. Uh, there's victory in Jesus. That same chapter I was reading there in 2 Timothy, verse 18 says, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. That's Paul writing that. Now, Paul was probably in prison when he wrote that. And the next thing that happened to him is he was taken out and beheaded. You say, well, that doesn't sound very, like much victory. Well, he went straight to heaven, didn't he? God used him probably more than any Christian that I've ever heard of. You know, writing scripture, like getting the churches started, and, and so on. The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. You know, sometimes it's by death. Sometimes it's by life. Uh, you know, they threw the three three uh, Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, they expected to be burned up. God saved them, and he used it that way. Uh, Paul oftentimes was thrown in prison and got out, but not every time. The last time he didn't. Uh, you know, God can use all these different things. Uh, it's possible to live that victory. He said, I've fought the fight, and there is a reward for living by faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Uh, rewards now, but especially in, in eternity. So I want to encourage you to be thinking about this, this subject, the fight of faith, and applying it in your own life. And what, what's the thing I can do in this situation that will be uh, faith? What, what will be the thing that will be trusting the Lord? And uh, that will help you in a, a lot of situations. Any comments or questions before?